it's a pleasure to be able to share with you a few of the advances that are occurring in the field of glaucoma at this time. But before we get underway, let's consider what are the glaucomas, because it is not a single disease, but a group of diseases united by their appearance, the effect they have on the optic nerve, which is the nerve of sight, sending messages along the nerve cells from the eye to the brain, which the brain then interprets. It is not a disease defined by the eye pressure. Consider the statistics that one third of people in Australia who have glaucoma have pressures in their eyes that are within the normal range. And there are more people with pressures higher than the normal range who do not have glaucoma than there are people in the higher range pressure who do have glaucoma. So pressure doesn't equal glaucoma but the higher the pressure, the greater the risk of glaucoma. The disease is defined by the effect it has on the nerve joining the eye to the brain. As Helen Danish Meyer, the Professor of Ophthalmology at University of Auckland has shown, and one of the latest researchers to show, this has been shown several times, our results indicate there are a few discernible differences in the shape of the optic nerve head, the beginning of the optic nerve, between eyes with glaucoma that have different levels of baseline pressure when the damage is occurring. And no matter what the appearance, and no matter what the pressure levels at the time that the glaucoma is diagnosed, the effect is the same. And that's what unifies this group. There's some inconvenient truths that we need to consider. Firstly, glaucoma is the commonest cause of irreversible preventable blindness in the world. It is usually progressive and it usually gives no warning to the person who is suffering from it until the damage is moderate or, at, or advanced. Treatment usually is effective and when you consider all of these facts together, the earlier the disease is diagnosed, the more vision can be saved and the better the outcome for the patient in the long term non-adherence, non-compliance to the management program because the patient puts other priorities ahead of it or they don't have time or they forget. It's a major challenge for this disease as with all diseases where they don't give warning that something damaging is occurring. And the, de the demands of treatment require a strong therapeutic alliance between the doctor and the patient so that they work together as a team against the common enemy, which is the disease, trying to rob the patient of his or her sight. There's a concept diagram that I think will explain some of this for you easily. If we take vision as the number of cells joining the each eye to the brain on the one scale and time on the other scale, and we see that the band down the bottom where there are few nerve cells and vision has been severely damaged as the zone of real visual disability. We start off at birth with a certain number of cells giving us a certain modicum of vision. And the sad fact is that as we go around the sun, we lose one nerve cell joining each eye to the brain about every 90 minutes. That's 16 per day, 100 per week, 5,000 per year, 50,000 per decade. So a normal 70-year-old, just by being alive, has lost 350,000 of their original approximately 1.2 million nerve cells, which means the accuracy of the vision as the number of cells goes down is dropping. Now what glaucoma does when it starts at some point is to accelerate this process. So instead of one cell being lost by normal aging every 90 minutes, it might get lost every nine minutes and the person heads towards visual disability much more rapidly. It takes a certain amount of damage for us to be able to diagnose the disease with certainty. Damage to the nerve structure, net damage to the nerve's performance. And at that point, treatment can begin and the best we can do is get the person back to their normal aging change. So things drop steadily at the same rate they would have if the disease was not there. If the disease has been controlled completely, 
and we'll talk about the strategies for treatment in just a minute. What we want to avoid is a situation where treatment is partly effective and the disease is slowed down but isn't stopped in its tracks. So the person heads towards disability faster than they would from the normal ageing change. And you can see from this concept diagram that the earlier the diagnosis is made, the more likely the person is to remain visually safe for the rest of their lives. So effective management needs a diagnosis that is accurate. You don't want to be told you've got glaucoma if you don't have it. And an appropriate strategy for treatment which is holistic, looking at the whole person, and eye-centred, getting rid of the risk factors generally as well as in the eye. And this requires meticulous follow-up to look for damage that is apparently getting worse, changes in the shape of the nerve structure, or in its performance, and we'll talk about the tests that do this in a few minutes. And we also, at the same time, not only want to detect increasing damage, but we want to detect an increasing risk of that damage getting worse. So has the person got something happening in their general health? Have they been diagnosed as having high blood pressure, for example, and are put on treatment for high blood pressure? Have they suddenly developed diabetes? Have they developed sleep apnea and are having periods at night where they are not getting enough oxygen into their system? Have they developed a thyroid imbalance? All of these things can contribute to the glaucoma getting worse. If a person performs certain yoga exercises with their head below their waist for long periods, that raises the pressure in the eye. So does blowing a wind instrument. It's been estimated that blowing a trumpet, for example, can increase eye pressure up to 70 millimetres of mercury, the normal range being 10 to 20. If a person does weight training and holds their breath while they lift heavy weights, that increases eye pressure. And so does drinking large volumes of water rapidly. And that can be important because some people think drinking large amounts of water is healthy for them. But it might be healthy, but it's better if it's done as sipping slowly over time rather than a rapid intake in a short period of time.